will buy a loan that the person stopped paying. And most people don't wake up one morning saying they're stopped paying. A lot of loans we buy are years behind, believe it or not. So it's not you wake up and they're going to throw you out. Um, so we will buy it just like somebody would buy a property. Like you buy a property to rehab. We're not rehabbing the property. We try and rehab the borrower and get them paying again. And then once they're paying again, their credit gets better Then they can refinance. We can sell the note, um, at a higher premium because they're making payments just mm -hmm. like somebody fixing up a property to turn around and sell it at a premium. We're doing that instead of with the property, but with a physical person. Are you looking to achieve massive success in your life without dealing with costly investment nightmares? If yes, then this is the podcast for you. Here, we provide engineers and busy professionals all the secrets and strategies to create multiple streams of income, build generational wealth, and live a meaningful life by design. Here's your host, Ted Patel. Hey everyone, this is Ted Patel, and welcome to this week's edition of Decoding Cashflow Podcast. I'm here today with Chris Seveny. Uh, Chris is a founder of Seveny Mortgage Notes Investments and has been a real estate professional for more than 25 years. He has also developed over 750 million in real estate till date. Chris has built a huge note investing portfolio by investing in first position performing and non-performing notes. He's also the host of Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. Chris, welcome to Decoding Cashflow. Ted, thanks for having me. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, how are you? Good, good. It's been All uh, right. a long day, but you know, glad to be here today. I love talking, awesome. talking real awesome. estate. Yeah. So uh, before we dive deep into you know this mortgage notes, uh, Chris, can you give us a little background about yourself? Like, how did you get started? First of all, in real estate, and especially in the mortgage note business. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I blame or thank my wife for getting involved in mortgage notes. Um, and the reason why is rewind it back, you know, prior to that, uh, you know, when I was in college, I went to college for civil engineering. And originally I'm like, oh, I'm going to be a structural engineer and design bridges the rest of my life. And then as I got closer to graduating, I'm like, why do I want to sit in an office and design steel beams every day? Uh, so I realized at that point in time, that's probably not going to fit me. So I ended up um, taking, a, as part of my degree, taking a few construction management pro, uh, programs or classes and started working for a very large uh, nationwide general contractor. So I was doing, you know, I like to term the phrase as the guy in the white shirt and tie on a construction project that looks like they don't do anything. Uh, yes, we actually do. We manage the contracts, the schedule, the money, um, actually do a lot. Yeah. Uh, did that for 15 years and, you know, kind of got burnt out um, after that time. Uh, about 10 years in, I moved from the uh, New England area down to Washington, D.C. And then I did, you know, five years down here in D.C. You know, just it was a wear and tear of the 60 plus hours a week on that. So as people uh, who are in the real estate space uh, would say, I went over to the dark side, which is I went over to work for a real estate developer. Um, and, you know, during this time, you know, I really never had built any portfolio for myself. And my boss at the time was like, hey, what's your personal portfolio? And I said, nothing. I'm going to be building my primary residence, um, which I'll have good equity in. But other than that, nothing. And he laughed at me and said, oh, so you're the 40-40-40 club. I'm like, what's a 40-40-40 club? He goes, you know, I'm thinking baseball, you know, 40 homers, 40 stolen bases. And he's like, you work 40 years or 40 hours a week for 40 years mm -hmm. to collect 40% of your paycheck. And all of a sudden it hit me like, whoa. <laughs> um, so between that and I you know, had a minor health scare at the time as well, uh, after we built our primary residence, uh, we had a good amount of equity. So we started buying some properties to rehab and rent out. So we did that for a few years and after a few properties, uh, my wife, says like, it's too much. We got kids. We're spending the weekends, you know, managing the rehab because I'm, so we were both hands on. She's like, we can't do this anymore. So that's why I blame my wife because, or thank her because I then was like, okay, I can't sit still. You know, I, you know, there's no way I'm going to sit still and do nothing. So at first I stumbled on tax liens and did like that for like three months. And that was like watching paint dry. It was so boring. There was no, sophistication on it. Um, so 
but I quickly found out there was note invest. And I was actually upset when I found out about it because I'd been in real estate for over 15 years and I didn't realize, I knew about private lending, which is okay, you, you know, have money and you give somebody money to go lend it. Um, but I didn't know there was this thing called note investing, which is you're buying loans on the secondary market that originated years before. And also you could buy them that were not performing or not paying and you could buy them at a discount. So I'm like sitting there thinking, oh, I can buy it at 50, 60 cents on the dollar, figure out an exit strategy, use the numbers or my math, you know, which I love to do, you know, sketch out kind of, you know, game theory of what can happen and then make money doing it. So, you know, I started doing that and it just started with, you know, I started my portfolio like three or four and then, you know, that turned into 10, then 10 turned into 20. Next thing I know, I have 50 of them. And then next thing I know, and I'm still working a W2 and next thing I know, I have 200 of them. And it's like, and I started taking on investors and then, you know, COVID hit and then, you know, I was still working my W-2. Then we had to go back to the office. And during COVID, it was easier to manage this. And then when I go back to the office, like, uh-oh, I need a business partner. So that's when I brought in my business partner, Lauren, um, to help me, uh, you know, manage our portfolio. We wrapped up those prior funds and then uh, launched uh, in 2022, launched a Regulation A-plus offering um, that, you know, allowed us to money from accredited and non-accredited investors and you know it's been you know basically uh you know sprinting since that time i guess is the best phrase we like to use uh, love it man uh so for for our uh listeners right uh who mm -hmm. isn't aware of what mortgage note is yep. can you give us a little more description maybe in the layman terms for, you know so yeah. that they can understand better yeah so here's the basis of it you ever buy a house um, and you're getting financing from a bank, you're getting a mortgage. Um, and most people don't realize, so I'm just going to use banks, no affiliation, just most common banks. You know, so you buy a half million dollar house and you get a $400,000 mortgage from Bank of America. Now, how many listeners, after you get that mortgage from Bank of America, then get a letter three or six months later that says, now make your payments to this other company? Yeah. Well, guess what? The note your gets mortgage, sold to someone your, else. Your mortgage yeah. is sold to someone else. Yeah. So all we're doing is instead of it being sold from Bank of America to Wells, it's being sold from Bank of America to my firm. And most people don't realize that, oh, I thought bank only banks could buy this. No, anybody can buy this paper. Um, so that's really breaking it down. Um, and we like to use a term that we like fix and flip notes. So and get them paying again. And then once they're paying again, their credit gets better, then they can refinance. We can sell the note um, at a higher premium because they're making payments, just mm -hmm. like somebody fixing up a property to turn around and sell it at a premium. We're doing that instead of with the property, but with a physical person. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the best strategy, right? Where you buy the note, you talk to the homeowner, mm -hmm. uh, you know, work out some you know, mm -hmm. negotiate the payments, work out mm -hmm. something between them and sell the mortgage note at the higher price. And uh, there, there are other exit strategies also. Would you like to just, uh, can you give us some more, some more details on the other ex exit strategy use? Uh, for mm -hmm. example, let's say if the mortgage, if the homeowner doesn't perform at all, what are the steps that you take? Yep. So there's really, like you mentioned, two main exit strategies, you know, um, you know, they, uh, either start paying and then there's that, you know, matrix, or if they don't, then there's that legal process of foreclosure. Now with, you know, the mortgage, it's basically secured by real estate. You know, unlike a credit card where if you rack up a credit card bill and don't pay it, it there's nothing for them to come back. They're not going to come back to all those fancy meals you ate. Um, where with real estate, because it's such a big um, you know, number that you're getting loaned, the bank wants it secured to something, which is the house. So we buy first position liens to make it simple. We're first in line to get paid. Um, so we control that asset if they don't pay, where we'll have an attorney send a demand letter, which is basically telling the attorney saying, you owe this much money that you need to pay to bring the loan current. Um, if that, you know, that take, after 30 days, if they don't respond, then depending on the state, um, 
you file a foreclosure action. Some states you have to go through courts, mm -hmm. other states you don't, but you know, it's kind of cut in half, 50-50. But if you have to go through the courts, you file a lawsuit. You know, you basically file a, a complaint where, you know, I'm just gonna use you as a Ted as an example where you were behind. I, you know, I file a lawsuit saying you had this, you know, borrowed this money, you didn't follow the terms of the contract. And because of that, we now have a right to foreclose on you. And then if the borrower does not respond, doesn't do anything, then it will go to foreclosure, um, which, you know, a lot of, you know, investors have seen foreclosure sales. Um, mm -hmm. And that's basically what it is, is we force that sale. And instead of Wells Fargo or Bank of America selling it, you know, or being the lender at auction, have any investments. And, you know, we either will either get sold at auction to an investor, or we as a lender would then take it back as an REO property. And then we would, of course, try and turn around and sell it back on the market as well. All right. And uh, when you put it on auction, it will be at the full price, not not a dollar, cents on a dollar. It will be at full price. Uh, it, it depends. Um, and here's the reason why is, you know, if let's say uh, a $200,000 um, loan and let's say the property is worth, you know, 220. OK, mm -hmm. you know, and let's say we bought that loan for 120. I'm probably not going to push the 200,000 because if I do and no one bids on it, then I got to take it back. I got to insure it. I got to pay 6% to a realtor. I got to, I'm holding that for another three, four, five months. Like I have holding costs. Am I better off selling it at 160,000? You know, I, you know, you hear the phrase, you know, um, pigs get fat and happy, hogs get slaughtered. Now I'd rather be the pig than the hog. Um, where I'd rather make good money on it than try and push the envelope, which then backfires mm -hmm. to the point of now I've got this house sitting there for six months that's vacant, that mm -hmm. might get ransacked, might get stuff stolen. So, you know, there is some methodology behind sometimes not taking top dollar for it and make it a win win for a lot of investors. And, kind of what we were chatting about, you know, before we hopped on, this is why I always tell real estate investors, you know, you, a note investor should be your best friend because we have properties that may go to auction and we'll tell you, Hey, our opening bid on this, we think it's worth 200. We're going to start at 140. you know? So, um, you know, just so you, you know, so you're not wasting your time. Those large banks, you know, they don't care. They're just going to bid whatever's owed because they're too, I want to say yeah. too lazy, but you know, they don't do enough research into what um, is their best uh, scenario. And uh, can investor buy directly from you before it goes to auction? Um, only if we were able to get the borrower to, you know, sign the deed over to us. But what we also um, have done is, you know, let's say again, take that same situation. Um, you know, we could sell you the note, that is a week from foreclosure. And then mm -hmm. let's say we sell it to you for 140, you could bid the 200,000, you know, at auction because that's what you're still owed. So then you just get it at that point in time as well. So we've, we've actually done that strategy where right before the auction, we basically sold the loan to the investor because they wanted to make sure that they didn't get outbid at auction. Um, you know, so they would, you know, basically buy it from us at that price we were gonna bid anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, any any specific states that you focus on? Uh, we have states we don't focus on. Okay. Uh, so New York, uh, uh -huh. the Pacific Northwest, Hawaii, and a good portion of the Northeast. And we say that because those states take years to foreclose. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly like the boroughs of New York, yeah. You know, basically, you know, my son's in middle school. Um, you know, his high school graduation would be, you know, for closing on that loan to give you an idea. Um, whereas other states, uh, some states, Texas and Georgia, 90 days. The wow. average, yeah, the average is probably about a 12 to 15 months when you put all the states together. Now, the other component to that is that's how long it takes us. Um, most larger institutions, i.e. banks, um, they're probably double that time because of all the inefficiencies and red tape 
that they have mm -hmm. to go through in regards to, you know, oh, this person handles it to the up through this point. Then he hands the baton to this person. Then he hands the baton to this person. Mm -hmm. So every time that the, the baton gets tossed, that file just gets stuck at the bottom of a pile until that person, you know, gets to it. So it takes usually large institutions a lot longer, which is also a reason why banks like to sell the loans is because they want to recapitalize that money to get it back out the door. Because as we know, banks typically don't like to hold real estate. Yeah. And uh, when you buy the mo these notes from the banks, yep. uh, what are the criteria you keep in mind? Like, okay, you want to get uh, 60 cents on a dollar or any anything specific. Of course, it would be non-performing notes, but mm -hmm. any additional criteria? Yeah. So we'll look at, you know, if you, you know, if someone asked me, what is our buy box? Um, you know, we like to target, I'll say middle income type of homes. Okay. What I mean by that is that could be a $500,000 home in Jersey, a $250,000 home in Indianapolis. And I don't even know what in California nowadays. Um, so kind of, you know, that middle income, we don't like in very similar to the question you ask yourself is, would you want to own that real estate? Now, would I want to own real estate in a big, heavy crime driven area? No, because if I have to foreclose and take it back, then I'm dealing with probably a house that might have squatters or other things in it. So that's one, as we've grown, we like to see loans with uh, like, you know, call it a hundred thousand dollar balance to them. And the reason why is interestingly enough, you know, whether it's $10,000 left on a loan or a million dollars, it costs the same to foreclose. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you're going to spend $10,000 to foreclose, you know, you don't want to spend 10,000 on a $10,000 loan. You know, you want to um, have some meat on that bone. And then, like I mentioned, the states, it's very important to understand the rules to go by. You know, I've invested in traditional real estate and, you know, it's basically, okay, the eviction process is pretty very similar in every state. I mean, it might take a little bit longer, but you now there's certain rights and stuff, but foreclosures, as I mentioned, can go from three months to five years. Yeah. You now that's a pretty big spread. So you better understand what that time frame is because you're gonna have holding costs, you know, and you're gonna spend money on legal and we target a specific yield for those assets. So if I wanna get an annualized 20% return, I got to make sure I understand that that's a three, four, five years, you know, annualize at 20%. I can't think it's going to be a year and it take five because then my return is, you know, basically would have been better off in the treasury. And um, are these like a bundle of loans or you can hand select the loans from the, from the banks? Yeah. Great question. Uh, it, it's both certain mm -hmm. sellers in certain funds, um, will let you buy or what's called cherry pick by one, mm -hmm. two, three. Others will want you to buy a pool of loans. And you know, for example, like we buy, you know, typically banks won't sell them direct. Banks will go through a whole loan trader, which is really an M&A firm. And M&A firms, merger and acquisition firms, have a side of business where they sell different types of debt and loans. Um, so the banks... Banks aren't going to know who's going to want to buy this. You know, they that's not their cup of tea. But these M&A firms always know who all the players are in the space. So they will usually represent the bank. And the bank's like, okay, because the M&A firm gets paid by us. We pay a, a buyer's fee, um, typically like 1%. Um, so the bank's like, okay, I can give it to you to sell and it's not going to cost me anything. Well, who wouldn't do that? Um, so... You know, when they put those out, they will specify, okay, you got to take all of them or you got to buy a minimum five or some of them like, hey, just buy one. Um, so it, you know, when I got started, the smaller sellers I bought from, which are a lot of the smaller funds, let you buy one. If it was a Wells Fargo, um, you're, you know, you're probably a minimum, you need $50 million in, in cash to buy from some of those big, big, big banks. Yeah. But they sell it in the pool, the big mortgage yep. pool. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Fannie Mae, example, just last week released a, a pool um, out, and they broke it actually into two. So they broke it in two hundred and fifty million um, for like the big boys and girls, mm -hmm. and then a ten million dollar pool for a small business. Um, so smaller funds have the opportunity to participate in a ten million dollar portfolio versus two hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what, what is the advice that you'll give for, for those who wants to get started in this buying, mm -hmm. uh, you know, non-performing notes? How, yeah. what is the first steps? How should they approach these M&A banks that you are talking about? Yeah, it is a very small and relationship-based business. <laughs> um, and really it's just, you know, attend some conferences and just soak up the information, soak up the lingo and just introduce yourself. Hey, I'm looking to get into the space. Um, people are very helpful in the space. And part of the reason why is somebody at one point coined the term co -opetition. And the reason they did that is like, we may buy about $2 million a month in loans and people are like, Ooh, that's a lot. And I'm like, well, we see about 300 million a month, um, in portfolio size. So we are just, and we, you know, it's a $13 trillion industry when you look at, and so somebody getting started is like, I want to spend a hundred or 250,000, you know, that's like not even a grain of sand on the beach. Um, so there's so much opportunity plus what you might want to buy Ted versus what I buy completely different product. So most people are very helpful in this space. Um, because it is small and we all want more people in the space because then it gives more buying and selling power between us. Um, so for me, I tell people, get some education, um, plenty of information, you know, on YouTube, our podcast talks all about it. Um, and, you know, attend some of the, a few conferences and just, you know, just absorb, you know, just start mm -hmm. listening and understanding the process because where a lot of people always get um, confused is they think they're buying the property. It's like, nope, you're not buying the property. You know, you don't own the property, your bank, you know, but same token, you know, if your roof leaks, you know, I'm like, people don't call me. You don't call your mortgage company when your roof leaks, right? And they're like, no, that's right. I'm like, yeah, you know. All right. So um, when you sell these mortgage notes, right, let's, mm -hmm. let, what, what is a normal, on an average, what is uh, the rate of return on your mortgage mm -hmm. notes? Yep. What do you so, target? Yeah. So it. So for performing loans, so there's kind of like three buckets that we'll put them in, you know, performing, kind of like re-performing, and then the non-performing um, one. So it's kind of like they pay all the time, they pay, but miss a payment now and then, and then they just ain't paying. Um, you know, the the solid performing loans, um, you know, typically around eight to 10%, you know, might be able to squeeze a few more, a point or two more out of that. Okay. The Reperforming loans, um, typically 12 to 15 percent. And this is on a loan by loan basis. Um, and then on the uh, non-performing stuff, uh, typically 18 percent plus what you'd um, you know look for. And you know part of the reason is you know you got to look at some of those spreads is you know you could do private money or hard money lending at you know 10, 11 percent. So yeah. all of a sudden if you're trying to buy a non-performer at 12, but well, why are you taking that risk for only 1%? You know, it needs to be some, you know, need to uh, get rewarded for the risk that you're going to be yeah. taking. That's true. Um, the other other uh, thing I'm curious about is why would a bank sell a performing note at a discount? Mm -hmm. Why why would that happen? Yeah, so it's interesting. I literally, before this was on a webinar and somebody asked me that question. Um, well, two two reasons. So, you know, between banks and um, more, um, I'll call it mortgage brokers, um, you know, where there's firms that really act as banks um, that, you know, basically broker the loan. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what they typically will do is they will bundle them up and sell them to Fannie Mae, a government-sponsored entity. Yeah. And the government-sponsored entity has very strict criteria that has to be met. Mm -hmm. And there's a good amount of loans that for some reason or another paperwork's missing, the borrower lied on the application, they took out a loan the day before closing, um, that all of a sudden, those loans don't meet that criteria, okay? Mm -hmm. So those, they call them scratch and dent, where they, you know, they basically are, you know, impacted. So now that mortgage company, all of a sudden is, they borrowed money to originate that loan, um, and now they're paying basically, you know, so they basically leverage it and now they're stuck with it. And all of a sudden it's like, uh oh, I gotta do something with this. I will sell it. And typically it will sell at a slight discount. Now the other component, depending on the discount, is you know, 2021 loans are gonna originate at three percent. Okay. Now 
would anybody in their right mind buy a loan hundred for a hundred percent of value um, that was originated at three percent when I can go originate a loan at five and a half percent today? No. No. So no. it's just like the bonds. What happened to Silicon Valley Bank? So they realize this asset not only was it impacted that I can't sell, but now it's been devalued because interest rates rose. And if somebody can on the street go get six percent on a mortgage and you're at three or four percent. You know, how much of a discount do I have to do to get it a six or even a little bit higher? Um, so the other is, which is a really complex formula, but if you really want to blow your mind, um, read the book Creature from Jekyll Island, which talks about how the Federal Reserve was created. And there's an analogy in there about how banks actually create money out of thin air, which, mm -hmm. um, and again, this is a podcast, so people just, you know, close your eyes for a second. But a bank, if you go in this, if you ever go to a bank and say, hey, I want to take all my money out, they're like, no, you got to come back. But why is that is because banks don't, if you put 100,000 in the bank, the bank doesn't keep the $100,000 in the safe. Yeah. The bank is only required, and it depends, depending on the time during COVID, they didn't have to keep any of it, I don't think. Bank only has to keep 10,000 of your 100. Yeah. But what does the bank do with the other 90? They lend it out. Um, now, if they lend it out and that mortgage goes in default, they will not want to keep it on their balance sheet. They'll want to get it off their balance sheet for two reasons. One is they don't want you, you know, everyone coming and get their money, but also it hurts them from doing additional lending because they now have to kind of hold reserves for that money, which then impacts. Now I'm like, oh, now I can't go lend more money because I have to put some of this in reserve. So, you know, that's kind of, again, gets very complex, but essentially because banks are creating money out of thin air because they don't have to keep all your money, um, they, uh, it's best in their best interest. Also, banks aren't built to def deal with defaults. They're like a car manufacturer on an assembly line. Things are going well. They're spitting these things out left and right. But the moment something goes off tilt, you know, the assembly line basically, you know, kind of shuts down and everyone gets confused. And it's like, oh, now what do we do with this one car? You know, it's got, you know, the tires aren't going on. Now what do we do? And they have to get 27 different departments to come in and do QC, QA on this thing to figure out what's wrong. That's what banks do with loans. And, you know, it's spending all this manpower and cost um, to, you know, manage a defaulted loan. Yeah. Instead of just spending all the time and money, just sell yeah. it off at a discount, get it off yeah. the books and start lending again. Yep. Yeah. And that's what they're good at. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we like to joke, you know, when you drive through a major city, you know, who owns the tallest building, you know, usually got a bank logo at the top of it. So they're doing something right. Yeah, that's true. All right. And uh, like for your investors, right? When your investors yep. participate with you, yep. uh, what, what is your strategy uh, for your investors? Like uh, mm -hmm. uh, starting from when you get them on board with you, mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what is the payments, the cash flow that they get on the regular basis? Mm -hmm. how, how, how is it that structured with investors? Yeah, great question. So we, um, two things. One is we like to keep it simple. Um, and also we like to say, you know, it's a, uh, you know, oh, I like to say it's a boring investment where we like to hit the singles and doubles. Um, so uh, for our investors, when they invest, um, they just get a, a preferred return between eight and eleven percent uh, is what they'll get. Um, and essentially, if somebody invested, you know, in today, which is the middle of the month, um, they would receive their payment forty-five days from now because their dividend would start accruing on the first of the month, and then they get monthly distributions that following month after. Um, we do not charge um, any type of fees, a acquisition disposition management fee. Um, you know, I, you know, have a team where we get paid salaries. So we are, we do have, you know, we do get paid, but we try and create that win-win for the investor where, um, we do keep that upside, but we don't get any of that upside till the investor gets their entire return. Uh, and also because we are the bank, um, you know, we don't leverage. So when you look at the capital stack, um, you know, our investors are preferred equity, but there is no debt financing, you know, squash between them and the capital stack. So, um, you know, things like capital calls and other things, you know, other types of um, 
uh, you know, things like that, you know, because there's no debt financing where we have cat. So you wouldn't really have cash flow issues in regards to cover those expenses. Um, we try and mitigate that risk. Um, and that's why I like to say it's a boring investment of people put their money in and, um, you know, trying, you know, get that, uh, monthly distribution. And is, isn't it operational in, uh, uh, it's a lot of operations, right? You have to collect the money, uh, make sure yeah. accounting is right for each and every note. How mm -hmm. do you manage that? Yeah. So great question. Um, so several ways, one is we do have an internal team of asset management, investor relations, and the smartest thing I probably did was bring on an in-house CPA accountant because mm -hmm. it is, can be very complex. Uh, but also by bringing on that team, especially the asset management side, uh, we control and understand and can model every single asset at any period of time. Now, we not only just model it when we buy it, we're updating our models every month where a lot of people are just like, okay, this is what I bought it for. Here's what I think I'm going to get. And at the end of the day, did I make what I made or did I not make what I make? Sometimes similar to real estate investors, like, right. you know, I bought a rental. I think this is what it's going to do. They just at the end of the year, see what they have for taxes, but they're not really figuring out, is this a good investment or should I put my money elsewhere? Um, you know, in-house, we have that. Now, the one thing that we do not do is we don't collect the payments from the borrower um, or deal direct with the borrower. We use a licensed servicing company uh, because of, you know, people who ever heard the term Dodd-Frank or Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, um, 2008 to 12, all the issue with the brokers, the banks, yeah. and everybody. So these servicers, A, they're the ones that track the exact balance on the loan, how to apply the payments, um, you know, to the point of your statement that you get actually has to have certain language on it, certain things on it. If it doesn't, technically the bank can't charge you for late fees or anything. Um, if the statement's not there by a certain day, there's so much government regulation. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to deal with that. Uh, but we'll pay a company 25 bucks a month per loan to do all of that, which to us is best money you could ever spend and let That's our true. asset management team focus on, okay, how are we going to work this one? What is our strategy? You know, um, you know, if this, then that kind of uh, theory. So in short, like bookkeeping, you already outsourced it to some other company, accounting, okay. bookkeeping, most of the, most, mostly, right? Yep. So, well, we have, um, so the servicing company really does like the 95% of it because they're doing all the payments from the borrowers and stuff. Yeah. We do have kind of our own internal a accounts payable, accounts receivable, but also because we are um, have that regulation A offering that was qualified by the SEC, we have to do audited financials every year for the SEC. Mm -hmm. We have to submit semi-annual reports. So my person in-house has that SEC experience. So by you know basically having the servicer give us all that information that we then track in our books along with our AP, our AR, and then we can you know, have our audits done, um, you know, in a very quickly, timely basis where I know somebody who tried to outsource all of that work and you just have too many people um, all working, not for you, but whenever at their leisure to get it done and it yeah. doesn't get done in time. And the last thing you ever want to do is not submit something to the SEC on time. That's very true. Never, never get uh, in crosshair of government. No, you don't want to, yeah. you do not want to get on there um, within their crosshairs because yeah. if they're coming for you, it's kind of like the IRS. You mm -hmm. could think you're doing everything right, but there's 4 million pages of code, you know, or you know, of law. They're just going to pick the one that suits them and say, okay, you know, here you go. Yeah. Kind of like, what's the one they always get? Like all the, um, you know, uh, you know, all, all like the gangsters and, you know, the mafia and stuff. Oh, was it uh, interstate uh, commerce or whatever it is, or wire fraud, because you wire sent somebody fraud, yeah. money across the state or something like that's the most common get, one, right? Wire yeah, fraud. We, can, we can't right. catch you for all the drugs and stuff, but we'll just catch you for wire fraud. Cause that one's easy to prove you now. Um, yes. All right. And uh, the other thing is I, when you said you, you were already on W2 when you started that business, right? Yep. So what is the advice that you will give to someone who is already on W2905 and yep. wanted to get in this business? Mm -hmm. So I would say do it. And here's the reason why is, and this is one of the reasons I got into this, was I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, which is most people, are in, especially today, in a real estate market that you want to get in real estate, 
if you want to buy an asset, especially an off-market asset, you're not there the day somebody is showing that asset. You ain't getting it, okay? Yeah. Whereas in notes, and this is what's crazy because it's a, the, the way the business works, and it's so old school, is somebody will send me a list of, I got actually one yesterday, 320 assets. And they'll say, bids are due next Friday. So I have till next Friday to basically do research, which I don't spend a single penny. I'm only basing it off the information they provide. And basically, I can do it at 10 o'clock at night. I can do it at 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, so your research consists of looking online about the property, trying to find information about the borrower, you know, look them up on, you know, basically stalk them, essentially. Um, but it's all free information online, which you can get online anywhere at any time. And then, you know, you put your bid in and then they basically, you know, like government, like your bids are on a certain day, they want everything, but if it's late, you know, the, you know, unlike the government, they probably accept it. Um, then they'll let you know, oh, we accepted your bid. So then you go through your due diligence process, which takes about two weeks on a loan, no signed agreement, no nothing, just an email that says, we accept your bid, here's the file, that has all the information in it, um, start your due diligence. And again, I sent, I have a realtor do a broker price opinion on the property. So somebody else drives by to get physical look at it. Mm -hmm. I'll order a title report from a title company. Um, and then I'll scan through the documents. And the most important document to look at is the, um, the servicing comments. So that company we hire, send the statements out. By law, they're required to save every email and phone and take notes on every conversation um, that they had with that borrower. But we get that transcript. So okay. we get to see why did this person stop paying? What is going on? You know, did they file bankruptcy 27 times? Um, did they get sick? Like what happened? Um, but you know, everything I said, you know, you don't need to go anywhere to do any of that. You don't need to do that during certain days and times. You can send an email to a title company at 10 o'clock at night to order a title report. You can send an email to a realtor at 10 o'clock at night. Um, the only time you really got to be on is when you're nearing the end, you want to have an attorney review it. And you yeah. probably want to get on the phone call with an attorney, which takes 15 minutes or 30 minutes. So that's really, and you know, the, that's typically the only, the only time you really need to do anything between nine to five is that. So you can do this anywhere in the world at any time during the day. So keep your W-2. Right. <laughs> Love it. Hey, uh, Chris, I'm um, really enjoying the conversation, but wanted to be respectful of your time. So we'll move on to the final round of questions. Are you ready? Yep, I am. All right. Okay. So what are the main source of information for you to learn and grow? Uh, for me, it is uh, actually uh, LinkedIn. And uh, so I'd say not mainstream media, but I'll like um, between LinkedIn and like, you know, X or some of these places between um, uh, that's uh, DS News, um, Kobesi Report, um, uh, John Burns, you know, anybody that provides high analytical real estate data. Mm -hmm. I'm a data junkie, so I like data. Those are three of the places that publish tons of data that I love to uh, see because I don't trust the news on what they say about real estate. I kind of look at the data, see what that's telling me. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. And um, there's one more, maybe I'll add, uh, Hedge Zero. I like I, Sometimes oh. they publish a good, uh, you know, mm -hmm. analytics on the real estate. Yep, of course, not, nothing, not 100% is right. Got to filter out something. But yep. yeah, you, mm -hmm. is you good. Yeah, it's and, take, you know, what you read and again, it takes certain things with a grain of salt because sometimes still st stuff can still get manipulated, yeah. but it's like, you know, you need to interpret the data to your own uh, use. All right. Uh, which is the one book that you'll recommend, which has the most impact on your life or on your business? Uh, so um, for the business is probably the book Traction by Gino Wickman. Um, I love that and, too. Yep. Which really the EOS method of, you know, organizing, if you, especially if you work with a team, um, that book really, when we started looking at it and implementing it, you know, it was like, who's responsible for this? And like, you four people would raise their hand. Well, I got a piece, I got a piece. And it's like, no, one person at the end of it, you know, 
is you know needs you know needs to be responsible so the buck gotta stop yeah. somewhere so that book is a great way to really organize and also figure out how to track metrics so you can grow as a company that's true and if if you assign two percent for the same task no one is responsible it should be one yep it should be you know fully responsible to completion yep. of for the completion of the task yep. for, exactly. for personal i'll just throw in um that is Recently, I read two books kind of together. One was called Vision, uh, Vivid Vision, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of writing your vision, not only professionally, but personally where you want to go, because most people always focus on their business, but not their family. And there's a book that kind of played off of that called Buddha and the Badass, um, which really mm -hmm. is a great book by um, a guy who created a website called Mind Valley. And if you've never heard of Mind Valley, check it out. The guy is uh, very unique in regards to has a lot of education content, but from people who are in the business, he's, I'll say he is anti-college and he challenged somebody, um, you know, he picks a person and have Harvard pick a student and see after five years in real world who got further, somebody who took his courses or life experience courses versus um, university studies. So, and I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other, but he has a, some, good education courses, but the book is very, uh, it's a great book. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. And what is the one advice that you'll give to our listeners? Any business or personal advice? Yeah. Uh, you know, two things. One is, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, you know, especially if you're involved in real estate. And the other is, you know, I felt like I wasn't living life until you know, I kind of, I'll use the term, had, you know, I don't want to say near death experience, but had a, you know, eye opening experience and really told me, kind of gave me that realization. And then when I did lose my father at, you know, pretty young age, that, you know, we're only here for a set amount of time. You know, if, you know, if you, you know, if you have a spouse, do you love them or do you like them? And then take your career you love your career or you like your career, you know, treat it the same way. You want to love what you do. And if what you're doing today is stuck into a nine to five, that is comfortable. And you're just getting the paycheck and covering the bills. Um, you know, getting that energy and getting over the fear of making that leap is hard, but if you do it and, you know, if you know, you're going to be successful, the reward is, um, you know, tenfold. That's true. Absolutely true. Right. Uh, last question, Chris. Yep. How can Decoding Cashflow listeners get in touch with you? Yes, they can go to our website, which is 7E Investments, and that's the number seven, the letter E, investments.com. Or you can email me at chris at 7E Investments as well. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. I'm on the website Bigger Pockets. Um, you know, I'm on most social media handles. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place um, if you're on a handle where you could uh, get and connect. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. It was a pleasure having you on the show. We'll stay in touch. Yep. Great. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Decoding Cashflow, brought to you by Aster Capital. If you found value in this episode, then please share it with someone who you think could benefit from it. And make sure to act on what you've learned. If you want Ted Patel to personally help you reach your goals, then feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with him. Also, visit us at astercapital.com for more free resources content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. As always, please consult your own advisor before making any investment decisions or setting a course of action. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of Decoding Cashflow, and we'll catch you in the next episode.